All right, so I have to say, it feels good to be back. Um, I've missed this meeting. Um, brownie points uh, for anybody who can, who can tell me where I've been for the last couple weeks. Anyone, anyone? Egypt, no. Yes, Africa, Kenya, both right. Although um, Africa is a wide answer because that could have included Egypt or Kenya. But um, we, we did take a bunch of us um, from HTC and some other, play, other churches and we went, we spent some time in Africa and it was a great trip. Um, and there was this kind of message or this theme that I felt like God was putting on my heart this whole time that, that we were there. And I think anyone who's been to one of these, um, these missionary trips where you're going to like a very rural or a poor place, it doesn't have to be Africa, it could be Egypt, it could be Mexico, it could be any of these places. There's always this thing that kind of takes away. Now, personally, I could speak of it when it comes to Kenya because it's always what hits me really hard from Kenya and is the fact that like, you know, you go to this place that is so poor and there's so much need and there's such a gap in everything that these people should have and what they, and what they do have huge gap in comparison to what we have and what they have, but at the same time, they're so happy and they're so joyful and their faces just kind of light up and it's very, very quick and you, and you piece it together and you say that something here is strange. How come I have everything and I don't have the level of joy that these people have who they just, they don't have the material things that we have. And especially this trip, I'm not sure why, but it just kind of sat heavy on me. Like the whole two weeks, I wasn't even able to really shake it when I got back. And I've been thinking about this for like the last, and then actually one of our quiet times while we were out there was focused on Philippians 4, which we're going to get into today in this meeting. But it was just kind of like sitting on me and I figured this is something I want to study a bit. And I want to kind of figure this out because if we were honest, every single one of us we always seem to want more. Like, I don't think there's a single person in here, in this room, that doesn't have a desire to have more, right? And not even do we desire to have more, if we were honest with ourselves, it is hard for us to accept less. And we've been kind of almost wired to believe and pursue this promise of bigger and better. Right? Like we want bigger and better. We want bigger houses. We want bigger cars. We want bigger bank accounts. We want, we want everything to grow. But the question is, is why is this so hard for us to be satisfied? And then why, you know, why can't we just be content? And that was kind of the thing that I was thinking about while we're in the middle of nowhere in Africa with people who are living in mud huts and their faces just light up and they have so much joy. And the quiet time that we read while we were out there was Philippians 4, 10 through 13. So if you have your Bible and you want to follow, it's Philippians 4, 10 through 13. I will read it out loud for us. It says, and this is St. Paul. It says, but I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at your last cares come has flourished again. Though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Now I speak to you in regard to need. Do I have learned in whatever state I am to be content? I have learned to be abased, and, I have, and which is abased is like I don't have much, right? That's like I've learned how to be humble, right? And I have, and how to abound, and that abound is like plentiful. Everywhere in all things I have learned to be both full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need, and I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. See, and when we were reading this, and actually while I was kind of studying through it this week, the thing that kind of caught me here, because I remember I read it in Africa, and I was just thinking, it is a beautiful thing to be content, to basically be happy with what you have. And God bless St. Paul for like possessing that spiritual, you know, virtue. But if, if, I, if we were honest with ourselves, I think it's something that is very, very far from us. And we are wired to want more and to want the best, and to, it's really hard for us to settle. But the comforting part of that, when I was reading through this a little bit more, it tells us that St. Paul had to learn the secret of how to be content. It says in, in verse 12, it says that he learned it. And now the fact that he learned it, that's great news because if we're struggling with it, that means that there's still a chance for us to attain this. We can still learn it. Because the fruit of discontentment, and I think a lot of the times we'll think of the fruit of discontentment and we'll think of someone who's just not happy or someone who just always wants more and who's never satisfied. But the fruit of discontentment, it shows up in completely different ways in our life. Because when you're discontent about something, 
right? Maybe it's anger that shows up. Maybe there's anger in your life because there's areas of your life that you feel entitled to, something that you should have received, but you didn't. And you are frustrated about that gap, right? Well, maybe discontentment in your life, it shows up as like depression or even despair because you're not satisfied with what life has given you. And you're thinking, man, I can't believe this is life. I thought life would have been more. But if this is all I'm getting, then we slip into depression and despair, right? Maybe discontentment is just relentlessness because you bought into the lie. And I think, to be honest, a lot of us have bought into the lie because we think that I will be happy. I will be content once I get blank. And because we're discontent and not having that, what do we do? We chase our tails, right? And we just run harder. We run faster. We're, we're, you know, we're doing everything that we can, and we get very, very restless because we're discontent. And why this content, why it was so important for St. Paul to be content was he had a huge calling at hand. And all of us here, if you have a huge calling, it comes with its own challenges, right? Like being a dad, being a father, being a husband, it's a huge calling. It comes with its challenges. Same thing with a mom, a housewife, you know, uh, a wife, right? A huge, huge opportunity to bless others, huge calling, huge influence, huge challenges. You know, I, I will tell you, it, having discontentment has huge consequences even for our homes. And I think if you looked at what happens when we are showing signs of discontentment in our homes, you know, it's, it affects the climate of the house. It affects the marriages. It affects the kids, right? Because if we're constantly expressing dissatisfaction about the people in our lives, right, whether it be showing up in anger, despair, anxiety, coveting, you know, all of that destroys the climate that we want to keep on our house. You know, when we're discontent, we are not letting the people that we know, the, the people that we love, know that we are pleased with them, right? That they don't need to be perfect. And I will tell you as a parent, how often do we show discontentment towards even our own kids? And I, I'm going to ask you, are you more probable to praise the strengths of your kids, right? To affirm them in the things that God given gifts and talents that they possess, that they are doing well, or are we quicker to criticize their gaps? Because if we are criticizing their gaps more than we are praising their strengths, that's a level of discontentment. And we have to own that. So let's actually define what we're kind of talking about here. What is contentment? Because I think we should start with what it is not, okay? It is not a good feeling all the time. Right? A matter of fact, contentment is not a feeling at all. It's an attitude of the heart and it's a mind frame. Right? And it's not to be confused with what the world might be telling us, right? Because the world might be telling us it's a pursuit of happiness or pleasure. Right? Like once you get everything that your heart desires, then you will be content. Right? But it, that's not it. It is also not the absence of pain and suffering. And that was proven very, very true in our time in Africa. Because we met people who were constantly in the most difficult of situations, right? They were in the most difficult of circumstances. And it was beautiful because we would go and we would do these visitations, right? And you'd sit with these families in these mud huts. And you can, you can imagine that these people, you know, they have a lot to pray for. And then when you talk to them, you say, hey, you know, at the end of the meeting, say, how can we pray for you? They would always pray for the same thing. Pray that God protects my family, you know? Pray that, you know, for health, you know, and all of these things that none of which were material. And it just shows you that so much of our discontentment comes from the material things. If I could just possess this, if I could just possess that, it will never be from that, right? It's also not a cheesy approach of putting lipstick on the pig, right? Because a lot of us think, hey, we're just going to, my contentment is going to be my turn that frown upside down type of attitude, Right? Because I'll tell you that ha like contentment is not just accepting the way that things are and getting used to it. It's not apathy. It's not lack of caring. And it's not being too easily satisfied. 
All of that ties right back into what you have. And contentment is not based off of what you have. Actually, if you go back to the word in Greek, the word actually means to be self-sufficient, right? It's, it's whether or not you are depending on external things, right? Because if you are self-sufficient, then you as a whole will be enough. You don't need all of the outside things. Um, and we should not be on this roller coaster that depends on whatever situation we're in, whatever season of life we're in, whether we are in a have or in a have not situation, right? Because we cannot deny that we're gonna go through hard times. We're also gonna go through times of extreme blessing. But contentment cannot be rooted in either one of those. Being content itself is not the goal either. It's not what we're living for. It is, you know, it's easy to end up being content for the wrong reasons. And I think especially in America, this is what we, could fall, we can fall into, right? Because we can feel a feeling of contentment because everything's going our way. Life is very, very comfortable right now. So therefore, we fall into this feeling of contentment. But that is not what St. Paul was referring to either. So let's explore it, okay? Like I said, contentment is not a matter of what we lack. So a lack does not determine whether or not we are, we are content. So I want you to remember that. A lack, because a lot of the times you say, I, I don't have contentment because I am lacking this, right? You're off. Your definition is wrong. Remember in verse 11, it says, I have learned to be content in whatever circumstance I am in. He continues in verse 12, three contrasting situations, right? Covering many circumstances that he's been through both good and bad. He's had, a, he's had a deficiency and he's had an abundance, right? So who, and the thing is, is, he says that I've learned in the deficiency and in the abundance, in both of those cases, I've learned to be content. So it can't be based off of what we have. Uh, again, you know, who would deny the fact that life is harder when we're in need? We can all agree with that. I saw with my own eyes in Africa. Trust me, they have it much, much harder than we do. And it is for that reason that God, in his wisdom, right, shows compassion for who? Right? In the Bible, there's always these certain classes, like these, these buckets of people that God says that he will always have compassion on. Right? The poor, the sick, the lame, the widow, the orphan. And why does he say that? He says that because, honestly, their lives will be harder. So it's okay to be in need. It's okay for it to be hard. We can still find contentment in that. The danger comes when we allow that lack to define us. When your lack all of a sudden becomes the biggest thing in your life, right? Because what we tend to do is we'll end up shrinking down and focus on that need like it's all about that. And to be honest with you, not even just all about that need. A lot of the times we will look at our entire eternity and we will shrink it down to the short time we spend on earth. And we'll think it's just about this. It's just about the temporal, right? It's just about the temporal life. And if we think that this life is all that matters, then when we lack in any aspect of this life that we're living right now, it will hinder our ability to enjoy it. It, we will, if we're only focused on then, this life here, then we will never be content because it's very limited. We're focused on the here and now, and when we're focused on the here and now and what else we want, then you can basically, it's, it's a flashlight on your discontentment. Just like Eeyore. You guys all remember Eeyore? Eeyore, was, there was always something negative to be said, right? That guy just couldn't catch a good day. Right? And I just want to go on record and say that negativity is not a spiritual gift. And I think a lot of you guys think that you possess it. It is not a spiritual gift. You need to wash that off. But if we're honest, every single one of us, we have at least a little bit of it. We're quick to see what we find in situations, people, whatever, whatever it might be. We're really, really good at pointing out what's lacking. You know, you could be discontent in your job, in your marriage, in your relationships, or even your friendships. And we're really, really good to point out exactly what's lacking. And the problem is, is we are so justified in pointing it out. And do you want to know why we're so justified? It's because they are lacking. 
Every single one of us is lacking. We live in a, per we live in a fallen world and no one's perfect. Every single one of us is lacking and flawed. The problem is, is we always want to focus on the other person's lack, the other person's flaw, that other situation that's outside of me. And how do we complain? I mean, how do we respond? We complain. We have self-pity. We try to fix these problems ourselves, right? All because we want to be content in all of those things. So we just go around trying to fix it all, right? But St. Paul says that our ability to be content is not controlled by what we lack. It's actually independent of our need completely. And I'll tell you, St. Paul, one of the things I love about St. Paul is he's just written so much of the New Testament, where if you ever want to know what he's kind of thinking about, you're going to be able to find it in one of his other writings. You know, he says that he lacked a lot. And if you look at the life of St. Paul, he even ended up lacking his own freedom. He did not have his own freedom because he was taken prisoner. He had real lack and real hardship. And one of the hardest passages to read from St. Paul, because we all think of St. Paul as this big spiritual giant, right? This guy, man, he just did the things that no one else could even think about. And you would think, right, like maybe God would give him a pass on some stuff. Like Christ would just give him a pass. But almost kind of a reward for all of his hard work. But in 2 Corinthians 11, 22, uh, 23 through 28, it says, But I more, in labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, uh, in prison more frequently, in deaths often. From the Jews, five times I have received 40 stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A day and a night I spent in the deep. In journeys often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen in perils of Gentiles, in perils of the city, in perils of the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness, in toy, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fasting, often in cold and in nakedness. And besides those other things, what comes upon me daily, my deep concern for the churches. So you look at all of those things that St. Paul was saying, yeah, I, I went through all of that. Like, I went through all of that. Life was hard. It was not perfect. There was lacking in every single one of those things, right? And I read that, and I see his, his physical, his mental, his emotional trials. And this is the same man who's been able to say that I've taught myself to be content. I have learned how to be content. So we say, okay, cool. So we, we can agree that it's not based off of what you're lacking, right? You could be lacking a lot and, and you could still be content. Well, my second point is, is that contentment is not a matter of what we have either. If it's not what we're lacking, it's also not what we have, right? Because a lot of the times you say, well, if I just have enough, you know, that's my solution. And if we were honest with ourselves, I think that that is our go-to for most of us. Most of us are thinking, I just need to solve the lack, you know, but if we were honest with ourselves, our hearts are never satisfied. You know, no matter what your heart gets, it's always going to want more. And I will tell you, one of the best mirrors that God gives us into our own souls are children. Because if you ever had a kid and your thing is just, I just want to make this kid happy. So you're pouring into this kid and you're giving this kid everything that he wants. And then all you're hoping for is that you're going to satisfy that need inside of them. And they're going to be just happy kids that don't have wants. Has anybody ever met that? Because what happens? The more you give them, the more they want. They're punks. 100%, right? And it takes a second for us to realize that these kids are punks, but we're just adult versions of that kid who's also a punk. And I, we say this all the time. It says, you know, we, we don't want our kids to want, right? So we give them whatever they want, but in turn, they're never satisfied. They're insatiable. They'll never be satisfied. And it's easy to say that about the kid, but it's much harder to admit that about yourself because I think we can relate to that. Think about how much you have more now then maybe you had five or 10 years ago, right? Now that's a broad brush, but, but most of us have more now than we had in the past, 
right? Many of us has even set goals for ourselves. And we say, man, this is my goal. If I could just achieve this, whether it be a level of income, whether it be a balance in a bank account, whether it be a house of a certain size, you know, whatever it might be, we've set these goals for ourselves, right? And then what happens? We possess it and it's not enough. So the goal gets a little bit bigger. The dream gets a little bit bigger. The hustle gets a little bit bigger. The desire inside of us gets a little bit bigger right? Nothing we will possess will ever last forever, and neither will the satisfaction that it brings. And I think it's a very convicting statement. Because if you were, were going to identify the one thing in your life that you said, man, if I just had this, I'm going to ask you, let's just say you just had that. How long do you think that would satisfy you? It always wears off. You know, and if we were honest, it's like drinking salt water. You might feel a temporary quenching of your thirst, but in reality, it's going to make you so much thirstier. And the more that we consume, the greater we will thirst. Because contentment has nothing to do with any material things. Verse 12 shows that making, that having or not having is neither wrong or a barrier for true contentment. But what we will not have What we don't have won't make us content, and what we do have won't make us content either. See, the situation is the same as lacking. We are, again, looking for outside circumstances to satisfy us on the inside. So I'm going to ask you guys, this is a little self-reflective question. To what degree are you looking to change in your circumstances to provide you with the satisfaction you are looking for? How much of your time, your money, your energy are you currently spending to try to change the situation you're in? Specifically, your time and your money. Look at where you're pointing those things. Because you're trying to get a desired outcome of that. And we tend to think that if I can change my surroundings, I will be content. You know, if I can change the things outside of me, I will be content. Right? We change it outside to produce a new circumstance that will make me or will make me think I will be happy on the inside. But my goal is to conform what is outside to please me instead of just transforming what is inside. And I think that's a hard thing to wrap your mind around, right? Is that we're trying to change the outside instead of transform the inside to what pleases God. And it's a strategy that is both sinful and destructive. And it also fails miserably because contentment will never, ever be found from outside circumstances. So contentment is not a matter of what we lack. It's not a matter of what we have. I'm going to challenge you, and I want you guys to to think about the fact that what if contentment is a matter of worship? Just a matter of worship. It's not about having or learning to live with less. The secret of contentment is found in worshiping our God and having the right set of priorities. You know, I will tell you, that is one of the things that was convicting about Africa. In Africa, I spent two weeks meeting with people whose stomachs were empty, but their hearts were full. And I wonder, why can't we learn that? See, because twice in that passage, St. Paul says he, he knew how to be content. In verse 12, he says, I know how to be abased. I know how to be abound. Contentment is tied to what we know. So how does St. Paul come to know this knowledge? In verse 11, it says that he learned it. Again, this is something that we have to learn. And the, and the Greek word that he used was learned by use and practice. It was something he practiced over time throughout his experiences. So what was it that St. Paul came to know? What was the secret? In verse 13, this is probably one of the most misquoted verses in the entire Bible because I think everyone uses it out of context. But 1 Corinthians 4.13, that's a memory verse. Does anybody know it? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Very misquoted verse. Do you think that St. Paul, what he was talking about here is that he could literally get up and do anything? Right? Did you think that he, he just figured this was like my, my life verse and I'm going to go out there and I can do great things. And I can jump from building to building. I can pick up heavy things. I can do all of this other stuff. Of course not. You know, ironically, did St. Paul do some pretty cool stuff? A hundred percent. 
right? What does St. Paul do? He spoke in tongues. He cast out demons. He healed the sick. He raised the dead. Much more than probably you and I could ever do. But that's not what he's talking about in this passage, because what do we talk about in this passage? In this passage, which is very relevant, and that's why we don't go Bible cherry picking verses to get them to mean whatever we want them to mean. This is directly tied to this passage where he talks about being content whether in a lot, whether in a little, whether in abundance, whether in lacking. What he's basically saying is I can navigate through any situation, good or bad, pleasure or pain, with all contentment through the empowerment of Christ. And I think that's a game changer. Because a lot of times we love that verse that we can get out there, we can do whatever we want to do. Nothing's too big for us. We can accomplish it. And what St. Paul's basically saying is I can do whatever I need to do to be content with God and only God alone. Whether I have a lot, whether I have a little, or anything else. St. Paul's contentment was completely removed from his external circumstances. He had a complete and utter dependence on Christ. He was not self-sufficient. He was 110% Christ-sufficient. That is all he wanted. That is all that he cared about. It was through Christ who strengthened him, and he was the source of St. Paul's contentment. Now, I will tell you, this book here, it teaches us Our biggest problem is not what's on the outside of us. But I think if we're honest with ourselves, that's where every single one of us looks. And we look out there and we figure out what can we do to change our circumstances that I could be happier. I could feel better. I could stop this. I could do that. All this this book teaches, it's not what's on the outside of us. It comes what's on the inside of us. Our greatest problem is not our circumstances. It is ourselves and the sin that lives inside of us. And The beautiful thing about this book, even though it points out what the biggest problem is, it also points out what our only solution is. And the fact that our solution is, we need a savior. And there's no way around that. Our greatest need is salvation, and that is exactly what Christ offers us. That is exactly what St. Paul had. That is exactly what flipped his whole entire life upside down. That is exactly what made him a new creation. That is exactly where he found his strength. And when our eyes are fixed on that, who cares about the rest? And I think that's what we're reading in the words of St. Paul. He was so focused on that, he didn't care about any of the material things. He had other things to do. And that's what made St. Paul St. Paul. And I think, you know, we, he lived with a single goal. And it was to live as Christ. Nothing else mattered. And that is why, other than outside circum- no other outside circumstance swayed him. He wasn't focused on any of that stuff. And to be honest with you, it was just a mere distraction. And I pray that we learn the same way that St. Paul learned. And it's to shift our focus, right? Not to whatever's going on outside of us, right? Not on the material things, not on these other circumstances that we think if this stuff that's outside of us just changed a little bit, then I would be happy. Then I would be content, right? But to change our vision, not what's going on the outside, but what's going on the inside. Right? Because if we focus on what's going on the inside, what do we find? We find he who lives inside of us. And that is all that we'll ever need to be content. Amen? All right, let's stand up and pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, in the name of one God, amen. Dear Lord, we thank you because we know that you are a good God, Lord. You are a God, Lord, who gives us this book so, so as just a roadmap to our life, Lord, that we can learn. Lord, there's so much going on inside of us, Lord, and and we distract ourselves from actually dealing with it, Lord, but we always look to what's on the outside because it's easier. It's so much easier to change other circumstances. It's so much easier to try to change or manipulate other people to get our desired outcome, Lord, because we cannot change ourselves. The only person that can change us is you, Lord, and the work of your Holy Spirit in our life. So, Lord, you even teach us that Even the act of repentance is a gift from the Holy Spirit, Lord. And we all know that it is your kindness that brings us to repentance, Lord. So, Lord, I ask that you work with every single one of us in here, Lord, but I ask that you change us from the inside out. I ask that you give us clear vision to see what's going on inside of our heart and what we're searching for and what we're longing for and even what we're chasing. For, Lord, these are the answers that we need so they can bring them to you, Lord, because we know it's just like drinking salt water. It will never It will never quench our thirst and it will never satisfy, Lord. But teach us, Lord, just to draw from your living water, that we may be in it daily, Lord, so that we could finally, finally, Lord, that we could be content, that we can be satisfied, Lord, and that we can 
Lord, that we can just love you more. I ask that you have mercy on me, Lord. I ask that you forgive me my sins. I ask that you be with this group and that you meet with us daily until we meet again. Lord, don't let church be the only time we come into your presence, Lord, but I ask that we just be in your presence daily. And I ask in session of all your saints and martyrs, here's when we pray one voice saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom.